Who was Darth Cognis, the immediate successor of the Rule of Two? Greetings, students of the Force, and welcome to the Archives. Darth Bane is the creator of the Rule of Two, put an immense amount of emphasis on the master and apprentice dynamic, making it essentially the focus of a new Sith Order. His apprentice and Darth Zana, whom he found as a little girl following the extinction of the Brotherhood of Darkness. But of course, after Bane's death, Zana would be forced to take an apprentice of her own to continue the legacy of the Sith. The apprentice was known as Darth Cognus. Out of the 30 Sith Lords in the Baneite Rule of Two lineage, not including any of Palpatine's apprentices, only 13 of them are known to us. Since we only know about less than half of the Rule of Two, we always try to find out everything we can about those that are mentioned and fleshed out. And luckily for us, Darth Cognus has an extensive story to follow in the lore. So join us as we open a Sith holocron and explore the second generation of the Baneite lineage and the Rule of Two, the one who inherited it directly from its creators. Darth Cognus has an unexpected beginning to her journey as a Sith Lord. She was a female of the Iktachi species, the same as the Jedi Master Seisei Tin. Most notably, Iktachi have a natural ability in telepathy and precognition. Four sensitives of their species are supernaturally strong with these abilities, and their precognition is usually far more accurate than their fellows. They could even outclass Jedi. Early on, the woman who would one day become Cognus was aware of this strong connection to the Force, deciding to teach herself as much as she could in order to hone her natural talent. Along with this, she was naturally strong in the dark side, having a strong inherent dark side leaning. This gave her a unique special ability to project a force dampening field around her, a power that was exceptionally rare. But even more than this, she had the ability to inhibit certain targets' ability to use the force. She could literally disrupt someone's connection to it, something that would prove to be very dangerous to not only Jedi, but also Sith in the Baneite lineage. This wouldn't stop them from using the Force altogether, but it would make using their abilities far slower and much more difficult. Cognus herself was mildly in tune with the Force as well, as she would often meditate to commune with it in order to gain insight or guidance, much like a Jedi Consular would. Make no mistake though, before her formal training, all of her skills were crude and rudimentary. But just starting out, she was already well ahead of most beginner Force sensitives. She had actually trained to some extent, even if it was self-taught. Many Force sensitives allow their talents to go to waste until they're given proper training, but Cognus was extremely patient, methodical, and even ruthlessly cunning. But before she would become Cognus, she was known by a completely different name. With these powers and attributes, she became known as the Huntress. The Huntress was a highly skilled assassin who had a reputation for always completing her missions. No one she wanted to kill ever escaped from her grasp, of course due to her extremely potent precognitive abilities. This allowed the Huntress to see into the future, seeing people, places, and in the present. She could also use the ability of psychometry, allowing her to see into the past. Despite not being properly trained in using force for combative abilities, she was incredibly resourceful and at one point even managed to kill a Jedi Knight, even though he hadn't been her primary target. He had simply stood in her way and was killed. But despite being such a successful assassin, her interest in perfecting her skills was beginning to wane. Her life had been feeling completely empty. She was alone, without purpose, and only moving from one contract to the next, in pursuit of only credits. Her life meant nothing. The only thing that entertained her anymore was reveling in the agony of others. That was until she encountered the Crossroads of Destiny. The Huntress was given an offer three times her normal rate in order to capture Darth Bane someone who she knew was still alive. After meeting her benefactor, she ended up using her psychometry on the planet of Ambria. Her interest peaked. She could tell that this is where Bane once was, and to get a gauge on exactly how powerful she was, Cognus reached out with the dark side. Upon seeing that Bane was in fact a true Dark Lord of the Sith, the Huntress became extremely excited. She was uncertain whether she had the ability to kill him, but was interested in the prospect of facing a Dark Lord. Finally, a challenge. The client, though, emphasized that she wanted Bane alive, desiring to torture him for killing her father many years ago. To that end, she supplied the Huntress with 10 times her normal rate, no less than 20 battle-hardened war veterans as mercenaries, and a bottle of Senflax poison to incapacitate the Dark Lord. With all of this, the Huntress set out to find her new prey. But first, she sought the Force for guidance. 
Very soon, the Huntress began to have dreams of Bane's current residence where he and Zana had been living, doing so under pseudonyms as aristocrats. In these dreams, the Huntress would even see Darth Bane's daily routine, getting an accurate look at the planet's surroundings. Based on what she saw, she cross-referenced the information with planetary databases and narrowed down the planet to one known as Seutric IV. With all of the mercenaries, the Huntress arrived at Bane's mansion. As the Huntress could sense that he was not home, she lay her trap. She knew Bane would immediately sense something was wrong, so her plan was simple, yet genius. The Huntress placed sonic disruptors on both sides of the entrance foyer, and positioned several mercenaries with stun blasters on nearby balconies, while she herself would hang back and project her force-dampening field. While the mercenaries distracted the Dark Lord, she would come up and poison him from behind, coating one of her daggers with the deadly poison. As the trap was now set, the Huntress took a little tour of Bane's residence, and eventually found the most important item to the Dark Lord his very own holocron. For a reason that she did not know, she was immediately drawn to it and felt a deep desire to claim it for herself. The Huntress took the holocron and hid it deep within her cloak. She could even hear its whispers from within her pocket. Finally, Bane came back from his outing into his home. Just as the Huntress had predicted, immediately Bane would sense the mercenaries. Her plan unfortunately didn't work out quite as well as she had hoped. Despite her force dampening field, Darth Bane was able to mop over half of the mercenaries present, murdering them all. And then, the sonic disruptors did little to slow down the Dark Lord. He was far more powerful than she had anticipated. But not a surprise for us. The Huntress found herself in single combat with the Dark Lord, only her daggers to defend herself. The Iktashi warrior was agile enough to evade Bane's blade, and the remaining mercenaries came to her rescue with grenades. While Bane was temporarily blinded by the flash of the grenades, the Huntress pulled off something exceptional, landing a deep gash on Bane's arm, successfully poisoning him. All of the mercenaries continued to fight the Dark Lord until he collapsed into unconsciousness. Bane was taken to a stone prison on another planet. There, he was tortured by the Huntress's client. Soon though, Bane managed to escape his bonds, and following, a lot of things would happen in quick succession. But first, we must set up the prelude. Zana had been sent out to find Set Hearth, a dark Jedi who had taken something precious from Bane, Darth and Dedu's holocron. Upon meeting him, Zana realized that Bane was trying to learn the secret of immortality, drawing upon the holocron's nature. To Zana though, Bane seeking out immortality violated the terms of the Rule of Two. Bane was only doing so because he believed that Zana had become complacent as a student and hadn't challenged him in over a decade. Fearing that she wasn't the true successor, Bane had planned to extend his life until he could train a superior apprentice. Sending Zana on this mission was as much an insult as anything else. Not wanting to be replaced, Zana took Set Hearth as her apprentice and went to challenge Bane for the title of master. Zana, though, would find him in prison as he was escaping and would openly challenge the Dark Lord. But unfortunately, Bane's lightsaber was on the belt of the Huntress, who had taken it as a prize when capturing him. Zana and Bane would more or less enter a duel in the corridors of the prison. At the same time, the Huntress was fighting the Dark Jedi Set Hearth in the prison hangar, realizing that there was another intruder. The Huntress would comment that Set had been the most frustrating individual that she had ever fought, as he wasn't taking her on directly. Instead, the Dark Jedi kept running and hiding, only jumping out every now and then to take a swing at the Huntress. And if he missed, he immediately would turn and run. However, the Huntress was much better than him, and grew dangerously close to killing the Dark Jedi until finally the prison alarm sounded, indicating that the self-destruct detonation sequence had now begun, with the Huntress quickly realizing in five minutes the entire place would be destroyed. The Huntress and the Dark Jedi had entered a stalemate, with the Dark Jedi striking a deal that would allow him to escape or he would sabotage both of their ways out. Begrudgingly, the Huntress agreed and watched with hatred as he made his cowardly escape. This, of course, rendered Zana without an apprentice. And speaking of Zana, her duel with Bane came to an abrupt end when the Dark Lord let off one of the detonators in the walls, separating the two Sith through rubble. When Bane ran towards the prison hangar in an escape, the Huntress was waiting for him. Bane immediately charged at her, but instead of running, the Huntress knelt before him, 
placing one knee on the ground and presented herself to the Dark Lord, holding out his lightsaber in one hand and the holocron in the other. Bane at first was skeptical, but the Huntress explained several things to the Dark Lord. The only reason she captured him was because it was for a job, which was now complete. Second, the Huntress felt that her life up until that point had no meaning whatsoever. Night after night, she had dreams of Bane and knew their destinies had become intertwined. The Huntress felt deeply that he would give her meaning in life. And so, she implored for him to teach her the ways of the dark side and to make her a Sith. At this point, Bane agreed, having lost all faith that Zana could ever defeat him and was inclined to take on a new apprentice. But first, Bane asked what the Huntress could give him in return. The assassin's response was simple, loyalty, devotion, and a shuttle to escape the prison, as well as the person who ordered the hit on Bane. And with great pleasure, the Dark Lord accepted the terms. The Huntress led Bane back to Ambria, the world where her client had fled. On the trip, Bane began to analyze his new apprentice. She had demonstrated great skill and intelligence. Once they arrived on Ambria, Bane had a brief conversation with the client before allowing the Huntress to finally murder her. Following, the Dark Lord laid out all of the rules and the expectation of the Rule of Two Baneite lineage, explaining how it differed from the Sith who had come before giving the assassin her first lesson. He then officially dubbed her a Lady of the Sith, Darth Cognus, named directly after her precognitive abilities, as this would become her defining trait of the Sith. Bane surmised that with training, it was possible that this Iktachi could have the power to see many possible futures, sort them all out in her mind, and maybe even use the Force to influence which outcome has her best reality in mind, a true gift of the dark side. But none of this could happen without Bane's former apprentice. Zana was still alive. Because of this, Bane sent out a summons for Zana to come find him, realizing that this duel was going to mean the definitive ruler, the Dark Lord, would rise, be it Zana or Bane. And Cognus promised not to interfere. As Zana arrived, Cognus declared that she had no loyalty to Bane or Zana, but to the Order of the Sith. No matter who won the duel, Cognus would serve as the apprentice of the victor. When the Sith eventually fought, Cognus was amazed at the speed of their blades. She could barely keep up with her eyes, even with her precognitive abilities. Cognus was so impressed by the incredible displays of the dark side, desiring that one day she too could wield such immense power. In the end, we know Bane attempted to use essence transfer on Zana to consume and take over her body but he would failed and was unable to triumph in the Battle of Wills. Once Zana stood up and regained her balance, she declared that Bane was gone, cast into the darkness, and that Zana was now the Dark Lord of the Sith. Cognus, keeping to her word, knelt before the Dark Lady and swore fealty to her new master. Zana would then inform Cognus of the terms of her training and that just as she had faced Bane, one day Cognus would be expected to strike her down. Zana then told Cognus to take Bane's lightsaber to use it until she constructed her own. This is the moment where the detailed history of Cognus would actually unfortunately stop as the Bane novels conclude. Cognus was a main feature in the third installment of the Bane trilogy, but unfortunately we know nothing about her years of training or even how she managed to overthrow Zana. However, we at least know that she did carry on this legacy. Cognus was extremely devoted to the Rule of Two, having trained under both of its creators, Bane being the main one, of course. She would be an avid student of Bane's holocron, watching and reviewing it many, many times, as she considered it to be her most prized possession. At some point, Cognus would take an apprentice of her own, a three-eyed mutant human, as she gave him the Sith name of Darth Millennial. The name is pretty interesting as Cognus could see into the future extremely acutely and she appears to have known that it would be a thousand years before the Sith would return to the galaxy, which is why she gave her apprentice this name. Darth Millennial was a prophetic statement to the Sith. Unfortunately, or perhaps ironically, Millennial himself wasn't too crazy about the Rule of Two and disagreed with it inherently. He did not see any of Bane's vision, 
nor understood his master's devotion to the idea. In his short-sighted ways, ironic as he had a third eye, he became convinced that many Dark Lords would be more powerful than simply two, and constantly argued this point to his master. Soon enough though, Cognus would see that her first apprentice was a failure, no longer worthy of the title of Sith, and she would officially dismiss him. In an effort to escape his master's wrath, Darth Millennial left her before she could kill him. He would go off to live on the ancient Sith world of Drome and Kaas, the place where Darth Vitiate once ruled the Empire. There, Millennial found the prophets of the dark side, and planned to raise up to be numerous and powerful, just like the Sith Empires of old. But unfortunately for him, they would never reach that level, never growing beyond the power of dark side cultists. Currently in the lore, it is unknown who Cognus' second apprentice was. All we know is that she selected a human male. But that was the story of Cognus, the second generation of the Bainite lineage rule of two. So for those of you who haven't got a chance to read the Bane trilogy, what do you think of Darth Cognus? And for those of you who have read the trilogy, what did you think of this dark lady upon first reading? We at the Archives have found Cognus to be quite fascinating. Iktachi Force sensitives have always been very powerful and unique specimens within the Jedi and Sith Orders alike. Their telepathic abilities are always on a completely different level. Cognus, of course, was so naturally advanced that she could suppress the Force in others, and not just herself. Had she been a Sith at the time when they were at war with the Jedi, Cognus would have been an absolute force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. But anyway, my friends, let us know your thoughts on Cognus in the comments down below, and the second generation of the Rule of Two. As always, my friends, thank you for visiting our archives today as we open the Sith Holocron, and may the Force be with you.